in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters, today finds us almost at the beginning of the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. How appropriate it is that in the days leading up to Christmas, we have an epistle reading that tells us about the Messiah that we love and worship. We're told that in the Son of God, we have redemption through his blood, that is, through the crucifixion, and secondly, that we have forgiveness of sins. And then Paul tangents slightly to talk about the Son of God, not just what we have in him, but about, but about Jesus Christ in particular. He says that he is the image of the invisible God, that he is pre-existing all things, preeminent over all things, and will inherit all things. He says that by him, through him, and for him, all things were created, in heaven or on earth, that what we can see and what we can't. All things are held together by him. And lastly, Paul concludes saying that Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church, and that he is the firstborn from the dead. Whenever we're trying to answer the question of who is Jesus Christ, we tend to make a few errors. One error or the other usually. There's usually one extreme or the other. We either falsely hold him to be human, but less than God. That is, the falsely is that he's less than God. We hold him to be human, but falsely less than God. Or we hold him to be God, but falsely less than human. Yet what we have here in the reading and in the time of year is a perfect contrast, something for us to meditate on in the Advent fast that we're currently in. This same Jesus was, is, and continues to be the image of God in overall creation. This same Jesus was born in a manger for us. All things were created through, for, and by this baby in a cradle. The one who was before all things and holds all things together has now taken flesh and become confined to a part of human history. And soon after, the one who has preeminence in all things will be taken with his family fleeing for their lives for safety to seek refuge in Egypt. In history, it was extraordinary for an infant to be king. Yet here, uniquely, we have an infant who is both king and God. Today's epistle reading stops here, where the declaration of Christology that Jesus always existed and is God, while also having entered history at a defined point and walked among us before liberating us from the power of sin and the power that sin holds over us. And that may be enough. But if we look a few verses later, then we'll see where the apostle was driving to, not simply to list a Christological statement, but with a purpose. So verses 19 to 23 read, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So, in short, in that section, Paul continues that Jesus came to reconcile, came to make peace in all creation through the blood of his cross. Certainly gives a new meaning to blessed are the peacemakers and the cost that it takes to be a peacemaker. This peacemaking mission that Jesus went on meant that all of us, all of us who were pushed far from God because of what we had done, could be reconciled, could be brought back, and brought to a state of being beyond reproach before the Lord. When our beloved Christmas carols talk about the incarnate Prince of Peace, it's this peace that we're looking for, our peace with God. It's very easy to look elsewhere and to point the finger. 
far from peace there's fracturing in this or that part of the world if we're honest we can look to our own part of the world but the news will probably show us other parts of the world that we can point to and say aha see it's broken there's war there there's peacelessness there even sometimes we see this tragically so in uh, this or that part of the church and we may be entirely right that there is fracture, that there is brokenness in various places. Cool. But the peacemaking mission of our Lord and Saviour, who was born in a manger for our salvation, who underwent that indignity of birth, this peacemaking mission was done for each and every one of us. As those who claim to be his followers, as we all do by, the, by taking on the name of Christian, how then should we respond? Part of the answer to this is very simple. We need to be looking to ourselves first. When we are making peace, we need to be restoring ourselves to humanity, which is to say, we need to be restoring ourselves to God. So how do we do this? Firstly, we do this through the sacrament of confession. We need to be removing and laying bare all sin, all things that are between us and God. Secondly, through prayer, fasting, reading scripture, and stewardship. Being in a fasting season is an opportunity for us. I know it, it's an inconvenience too. But it is still an opportunity. It's not, there's not something magical that happens by not eating meat for a while. It's, we do this because by doing so, we're fighting the passions, we're fighting the temptations to sin that, that take a hold of us all too easily. And this is the first step along that war with the passions. And with this, with this season, we spend our time in prayer, perhaps in increased prayer. We spend our time reading scripture, perhaps a little more scripture than usual. We spend our time in stewardship, <coughs> Working out our priorities, not only what they are, but what they should be. In our time, our resources, and our abilities. And we do all of this so that we make Christ the focus, not just of our Sunday, not even of just of our weekend, but of our lives. The third way that we do this is through the sacrament of communion. We, we have communion. It's not because we deserve it. There's nothing deserving about it. It's not just because that's what we do at particular times of year. We do this because Christ told us to. And he told us to do this on an ongoing basis. We do this because he told us that unless we do this, we have no life in us. We do this because we love him, because we follow him, and because this is the only response that's appropriate. Dear brothers and sisters, we're called to something very different from the world and from the culture around us. We're called out as even the name of church, the name of ecclesia that we say that we belong to. This tells us that we are called out. And sometimes we feel that tension and strain, sometimes more than others, perhaps more so consistently when we celebrate Christmas at a different time to the, to the world around us. But we can't expect nothing less than this difference, than this distance around us. After all, we're called to be a chosen people of royal priesthood. When the priest raises the body of Christ before communion, exclaiming, the holy things are for the holy, we're called to be that holy, those holy ones. We're called to be the set apart. We're called to be the called out. We're called to owe our allegiance to God and to follow Him unswervingly. May God grant us the patience and the peace to live our lives for Him. Amen.